Who do you think the most famous person in the world is right now? Who do you think it is? Just go ahead and let me know down in the comments below. You could guess Elon Musk. You could guess Jeff Bezos. You could guess uh, Simone Biles. You could guess uh, Suni Lee. You could guess Michael Phelps. Uh, you could guess, um, you know, Tom Hanks, uh, uh, Harrison Ford, um, you know, Joe Biden. Uh, who do you think the most famous person in the world is currently here in 2021? Got it? Okay, well, if anyone guessed any of those names, you would have been wrong. Yeah, I know. Th those are all famous people. Those are all really important names that, you know, that I'm sure you've heard about. But have you heard this name, Dwayne Johnson? Dwayne Johnson. Yes, I don't know if you know him. It, it, here, I'll make it easy for you. Here's a picture of him. Oh my goodness, no, no, no. I'm so sorry, that, that's a picture of me. Oh my goodness, I, how did that get in there? Oh, now you know why Heather married me, huh? I mean, goodness. No, no, that's not me. My body type is not like that. Instead, it's more like this. Yeah, no, in, in all seriousness, Dwayne Johnson is probably better known as The Rock. Yes, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I remember, I remember this guy growing up, and according to a quick Google search, he is the most famous person in the world right now. Now, he's got a lot of followers on Instagram and on social media. He, he's got a great personality and smile. He's got movie deals. He not only is called The Rock, but he is actually chiseled out of rock. I mean, just look at look at his biceps. I mean, those are bigger than my, that's bigger than my waist or something. Uh, goodness, I mean, but with all of these modern trappings of success that make up the Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he also has a publicist who maintains his public image and helps him become even more and more famous and even more and more well known. Now, who do you think the most famous person in all of human history is? It's definitely not Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Sorry, guy. I mean, you know, 2021 has been good to you, but not all of human history. Who do you think the most famous person is in all of human history? Well, if you guessed a guy from the Middle East who is a, a Jewish carpenter, a, a Jewish construction worker that died childless, homeless, and without honor, you'd be right. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, I'm Let's be honest, you know, he's got a little he's got a, a little boost because after all, he is the son of God. I mean, he's 100 percent divine while being 100 percent human. So, I mean, he's able to do things that you and I can't necessarily do because, hey, he's the son of God. You know, he's got a, a leg up on the competition. But if we just kind of strip all of that away and just look at Jesus, the human, Jesus, the human being, you'll see a reason why he is so influential, so famous, so consequential in all of human history. And that's because of relationships. Jesus intentionally uh, built his life around relationships in order to impact people around him and change the lives of those around him. And because of that, we are still ex experiencing the ripple effect of the lives that were changed by Jesus well over 2,000 years ago. Now, Jesus is the greatest example that we have in all of human history of how best to build the relationships that we actually want to have in our lives, the relationships that breathe life into our lives and ultimately show us how to love the, the, those around us, but also to receive love from those around us. If you examine Jesus's life, you will find a consistent theme running throughout all of his teachings, all of his interactions, all of his arguments, all of the parties, the, the dinners that he goes to, the, the wedding feasts that he's at, anything you will see this love expressed through relational community. Jesus was all about building up relationships 
so that he could best love the other person. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what their past was. It didn't matter what they believed personally. It didn't matter what their socioeconomic status was. All that mattered was Jesus expressing his love towards that person by prioritizing relationship with that person. And Jesus, the best way that he was able to do this, I mean, honestly, he's like a relational genius. He established proper boundaries in order to best leverage the relationship that he had with an individual. And you can examine the, these relationships that he had by building uh, these basically realms of relationship within his life. He built four realms of relationship in his life so that he could then pivot and prioritize the relationship that he has with the person so that he could best love that person wherever they were and wherever they fit within these realms of relationship. So go ahead and grab a piece of paper if you don't already have one or just take a screenshot of the, of, of your phone or, or the screen right now because I want you to draw three circles. Draw a, a small circle right in the center and, and label that core and then draw a, a larger circle outside of that and, and label that circle and then draw the final circle and label that community. And then outside of that third circle, the empty space that's on the page or on the screen, I want you to label that crowd. These are the four realms of relationship that Jesus built within his life in order to leverage his relationship with them so that he could best love them where they were and where they fit within these relationship re relational structure. So these four realms of relationship are displayed not only to us in modern psychology and counseling practices, it's not only supported by them, but we see this, we see Jesus placing boundaries in his relationships so that he could structure them in a way that allowed him to best love everyone that he came in contact with. We see this being played out in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 17, where it says, One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, whom he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, Judas, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were, was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. So here we see Jesus is establishing a relational structure, a relational network to, in order so that he could define his relationships with all of his, his followers, all of these people, so that he could best love them and, best ha and have better relationships with them. And so Jesus does this by establishing four different realms of relationship. And if it was good enough for Jesus, the most famous person in the world, it's good enough for you. So let's dive in right now. How do we actually build these types of relationships in our lives so that we could have better relationships, so that we could love people better? Well, first and foremost, you need to do what Jesus did and identify your core. You need to identify your core. Jesus identified his core group of three guys. He had three guys that had unprecedented access to him that where he was extremely authentic and transparent with, where they were able to see him at his greatest moments and also his weakest moments. The, these three guys were always around him. And those names, we already heard them, is Peter, Simon, who Jesus calls Peter, James and John, who were brothers. Jane, Peter, James, and John were basic, were the three guys that comprised Jesus' core group of friends, these, these core relationships that he had with these three individuals. Now, Jesus does something uh, fantastic. He gives each and every one of them nicknames. Jesus gives Peter a nickname, and he calls him Rock in Matthew chapter 16, verse uh, 16 to 18. So take that, Dwayne Johnson. You, you aren't the Rock. No, Peter is the 
the rock. Jesus already gave him. So you're a poser and you're trying to copyright on the nickname that Jesus already gave Peter. So yeah, so Peter is the rock here. I don't know if Peter was chiseled out of rock like Dwayne Johnson is, but you know, we'll just, we'll just let bygones be, be bygones. But Jesus gives Peter a nickname of the rock. And then he also gives James and John, who were two brothers, he gives them nicknames and he calls them sons of thunder. I mean, isn't that amazing? That's a, a wonderful nickname. I mean, Jesus was really good at giving people nicknames and building a relationship with them and uniquely understanding them and giving them like a new identity. And so Jesus is giving Peter, James, and John these nicknames that encompass their identity. And so you better believe that Jesus's core group of guys were strong-willed, they had fiery personalities, they were successful businessmen, they were also providers of their fam for their families, and, and at least in James and John's case, they were very well connected with the religious and political structure of their day because of the family they came from. These three guys were not elites, they were blue collar workers. They were, you know, grunts. They were not part of the 1% of Jesus's day, but Jesus identifies them and brings them into his core group so that he could give them special and unique access. And, and because of that, they were around when Jesus had significant miracles where he healed, he raised the girl from the dead and where he was transfigured in front of them. Matthew chapter 17 shows us this. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Only Peter, James, and John saw this. Only these three guys, only Jesus' core group of, of, of relationships saw this. They were there when Jesus was transfigured and his face shined bright like the sun and his clothes were as white as, the, as light. I mean, they were the only ones up there and they were able to witness this. And so Jesus was giving them special and unique access to him, but also was giving them greater quantity of time and quality of time uh, for building up a better relationship with them. In Luke chapter five, we see that these three guys were potentially one of uh, were potentially uh, followers of Jesus probably the longest out of everyone. And then in Mark chapter 14, near the very end of the, of his gospel, he talks about how Jesus goes to Gethsemane and he goes there to pray and he brings all of his disciples with him and says, sit here while I pray. Then he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might come, might pass from him. So what's happening here? Jesus tells all of his disciples, these 12 guys to come out with him so that they can pray. He tells them to sit there and pray. And then he takes these three guys and then he immediately becomes emotional and, and authentic and, and, and uh, transparent with them and says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. It, it, it feels like I'm, I'm going to die because of this. And he's being completely authentic and transparent with his core group of friends. And so these three men were there at Jesus's greatest moment of glory where he's transfigured, but he's, they're also there at his darkest moment of trial. Now, Jesus did not waste his time, and he, nor was he unintentional with his relationships. And I love what Michael, author Michael Hyatt says about Jesus, where he says that Jesus focused on true, true depth and long-term impact by spending the greatest portion of his time and efforts with just three guys. So who is it that you are spending uh, a, a great, the greatest portion of your time with? Who is it that's in your core group? What are their names? Go ahead and put their names in that little, in that smallest circle, in the innermost circle that you have on your page. Go ahead and write their names. If you can't identify them, who could that be for you? List those people out right now and then take it one step further. Tell those people who they are to you. 
Because when you define the relationship with others, you are giving permission for that relationship to go deeper. So do that this week. Text that person. Schedule a a FaceTime or, or a coffee date or lunch with them. Let them know who they are and what they mean to you. Let them know that they are in your core group of friends and that they have unique and special access to you, just like Peter, James, and John did with Jesus. Now, Jesus established this relational structure or a structure in his life, these four realms of relationship, and he identified his core group, but he also identified his circle. He also identified a circle around him. So we read earlier from Luke chapter six about how Jesus called 12 guys to have constant, consistent, open access to him during his three years of public ministry. But But if you know the Bible at all, you know that these guys, these 12 guys were called the disciples. But did you pick pick up on something else that was happening in Luke chapter 6? Look at verse 17 again. It says, he, Jesus, went down with them, these 12 guys, and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. This is really important. I mean, did you pick up on it? These 12 guys that we call the disciples, but then wait a minute, there's a large crowd of Jesus' disciples that are waiting for him. Uh, Other disciples that, that weren't included in the 12. I mean, this is really important because Jesus is establishing boundaries within his relationships. So he calls all of his disciples, all of his followers to come to the mountain. We're gonna have a meeting. And then from this meeting, he pulls out 12 guys and not only calls them his disciples, which is really just a fancy way of saying that a person has come to Jesus, is following Jesus, and is joining Jesus in his mission of changing the world one person at a time. But he not only calls them disciples, but he also designates them as apostles. Now, this is really important because this word apostle literally means one who is sent out one sent out. So Jesus is identifying 12 individuals in order to give them greater access to himself so that one day he could send them out and be his representative to those around him, to those around them. And so Jesus is identifying these 12 guys in order to have a greater relationship with, as opposed to those who were in the community in this third realm of relationship that we'll get to in just a second. Now, Jesus has this inner circle of three guys. He has 12 men that are following him that have really a lot of access to him. But in that rela- those relationships, he's got three guys who make up his core, but then the rest, the other nine men, were in his circle, and they comprised this circle. And, and he, was t- he called them out of this crowd in order to identify them in order to reconfirm his dedication with them in order to reaffirm his interaction and relationship with them i mean just think about that what if you were one of those guys standing in the crowd that day just another face in the crowd and jesus calls your name and he 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 says come on up come come up higher to the mountain come on up come closer to me what if you were peter that day what if you were Nathaniel? What, what if you were Bartholomew? What, what if you were Judas? And, and you get called and you said, hey, come closer to me. You can have greater access to me. You can be in a, a better, deeper relationship with me. You can be part of my circle. You can be in my inner circle. I mean, talk about defining a relationship. Jesus is all about defining relationships so that that relationship can have permission to go deeper And so Jesus had 12 disciples in his inner circle, three of which comprised his core group of friends. All 12 disciples had access to Jesus. They all lived daily, their daily lives with one another. They knew Jesus. They could have Jesus explain to him uh, teachings that they maybe didn't understand. Plus, they were able to accomplish and partner with Jesus the things that he wanted to accomplish. And so they were witnesses to most of Jesus's miracles and were personally exposed to how Jesus loved, ministered, and built relationships with others. So why did Jesus do this? 
Why did Jesus have a core group of friends? Why did he have a circle of, of an inner circle of, of followers that, that we know as the disciples or the apostles? Why did he do this? I mean, after all, he's the son of God. He can, he can do anything that he wants to. He, he can work miracles. He can, he can absolutely do anything he wants. He's the son of God. He's eternal. Why does he pick 12 dudes in order to help him spread the good news of the gospel? The reason why he did that was for a very specific reason. Jesus wasn't planning on being around forever. Instead, he had three years in order to intentionally build into these men who would then be sent out in order to be his representative to those around them. And because of that, Jesus invested and leveraged these relationships. Why? Because Jesus was sent here for one reason, to become our sacrificial savior in order to be our perfect sacrifice and that through his crucifixion and death and burial and bodily resurrection from the dead you and i can enter into a relationship with our with god our heavenly father with our creator and because of jesus and how he satisfies god's just wrath we are able to enter into a relationship with him when we place our faith in him when we have to, when we place our trust in him now, Jesus shows us that disciples weren't made just by reading books or listening to his sermons. Instead, they were intentionally invested. Instead, he built disciples by intentionally investing himself into them so that they could then intentionally invest themselves into others. So that is exactly how Jesus leveraged his relationships in order to grow them. Jesus doesn't do this by oh just calling 12 guys and then just kind of, hey, listen to me and this talking head and glean, glean all of this information and then go regurgitate that. No. Instead, he's saying, won't you come be my friends? We'll live life together. We'll understand one another. You'll see how I do things so that you can then go do those things as well. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verse 15. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everyone, for everything that I learned from the father. I have made known to you. These are his, this is his inner circle. These are his friends where he is living his life in authentic community with them. They, they see what he does, they see how he teaches, they, they understand what makes him tick so that they could then reproduce that in, relation, in the relationships that they have with other people. I love what C.S. Lewis says when he describes what friendship really is all about. He says, friends are not primarily, primarily absorbed in each other. It is when we do things together that friendship springs up, painting, sailing ships, praying, philosophizing, fighting shoulder to shoulder, friends look in the same direction. Jesus intentionally invested three years of his life building into 12 guys so that one day they would look in the same direction that he was looking in. That's what relationships are all about. That's what this inner circle is all about, where Jesus is building into these guys so that one day they would look in the same direction as he was. Now, they were all different from one another. They didn't have the same priorities. They didn't have the same backgrounds. They were very diverse, and Jesus prioritized this diversity so that one day they would all start looking in the same direction. I mean, just ch check out this chart that, that shows and documents exactly who they are, what they did, where they came from, and kind of the uniquenesses about who they were. Jesus is prioritizing not homoge homogeneous relationships, but instead he's prioritizing diverse relationships where people don't look like one another, where your friends in your inner circle should not think like you or vote like you or, or uh, spend money just like you or just have all of the same characteristics and the same priorities and the same everything as you. Instead, there should be diversity in your inner circles. And because there, if you have diversity within your inner circle, that means that you can start expressing Jesus' love to one another in different ways. That means that you can start stretching and growing yourself and helping yourself be, model Jesus' love 
to those around you. Because when you are in diverse relationships with others, those relationships will stretch you, will grow you, and help you model Jesus' love to one another. It's really easy to love people that are just like you. But it's a completely different story when you try to love others who aren't like you at all. And we'll talk more about that next week when we wrap up our hashtag relationship goal series, when we look at how to deal with difficult people. But it's really important to figure out who it is that you are allowing into your inner circle. Jesus spent all night praying about who it was uh, he, who who it was that he was going to select in order to be in his inner circle. And the apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And then Proverbs 13:20 sh- shows us that whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the company of fools will suffer harm. It is so important that you select the right people to be in your inner circle in this second realm of relationships that you have in your life. So who is it that is in your inner circle? Who is it that's in your circle? If you don't know who that is, here are just five questions that you can begin to ask yourself so that you can kind of narrow down who it is that should be in your inner circle compared to who it is that should be in your core or who should be on the outskirts in your community. So the first question is, is this person a person of character? Secondly, does this person share a common vision for their life? Thirdly, does this person show up for me? Do they show up for me? Fourth, does this person love the real me? You can be authentic with them, you can be honest with them. Do they still love who you truly are? And fifth, Does this person tell me the truth even when it is tough? Who is it that's in your circle right now? List out their names and go to them, identify them, define the relationship so that you can deepen that relationship with them. So we see that Jesus built this relationship structure in his own life. He has a core group of guys, these three men that are doing life with him that have basically unhindered uh, access to him. But then he also has a circle, an inner circle of 12 men uh, total that have access to him or he's building into them or they're helping one another grow and stretch. But thirdly, Jesus also identifies his community. And you, if you want to build your relationships like Jesus so that you can love others like Jesus, you need to identify your community. Now, a lot of people showed up that day when Jesus called all of his followers to the mountain. I mean, people that were his disciples, people that heard about him, people who needed healing, people who wanted to hear him teach, they were all there for a common reason, Jesus. And that's what community is. A community is a group of people who share something in common. It is a, it is an extended network or really a web of people that are connected to one another and share something in common. The people that were there that day, their commonality was Jesus. They were his disciples. They came to him. They followed him. They were joining him in his mission of changing the world one person at a time by bringing people people into the kingdom of God. Now Luke identifies this group that were there that day in Luke chapter 10 when he says that there were 72 other disciples of Jesus that he was intentionally building into albeit to a much lesser degree and a much lesser extent of involvement in their lives compared to the core group or the circle group. This community, Luke chapter 10, shows us that after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Man, this is what community is all about. Community is important and Jesus shows us that it is not optional. 
You should have relationships with people where you share commonalities with one another so that you can serve them, love them, and ultimately point them to Jesus. You can't serve people, you can't love people, you can't point people to Jesus if you refuse to connect with them and be in community with them. This is the whole purpose for why we did our Halloween outreach and gave away goodies. This is the exact purpose for why we did this, so that we could connect with people who are in our physical community here in East Harlem and have a commonality with them so that we can get to know them, so that one day we can serve them, love them, and point them to Jesus. That's why we did the Halloween outreach. That's why we're going to be doing the Thanksgiving food pantry. That's why we're doing the holiday market again this year so that we can serve people, love them, and point them to Jesus. Now, I've got a community here in East Harlem. Uh, you know, I grew up in Cincinnati. I'm not from here. And so I'm not a native New Yorker. I'm, I've moved here. And so these past two years, I've been developing relationships with people based on commonalities. One commonality is coffee. So I go to El Barista anytime I want coffee in, in this neighborhood. There's other options, but I go there specifically to build a relationship with the owner named Emmanuel or Manny for short. He's the owner of El Barista and we've connected with one another we get we know each other we were developing a relationship and friendship we're connected on social media we know one another we are connected to one another we have a commonality with one another and why am i doing that so that i can serve him so that i can love him so that i can point him to jesus Another guy is uh, just around the uh, the other corny uh, other corner on uh, East One Sixteenth Street. The deli guy he refuses to speak to me in English. Instead, he will only speak to me in Espanol. Uh, he he will only uh, speak to me in Spanish. Why? Because I shared with him that unlike him, I struggle with Spanish and I want to learn Spanish. And so we have a commonality with one another. He really knows Spanish because that's probably his native language. But me, I don't know Spanish. So he's helping me, teach me, helping me learn Spanish whenever I go into the deli. There's another guy, he, uh, Keith, out on the street. I mean, every day I see him each and every day while I'm walking my dog. He, he calls me Caesar, even though he knows my name. It, we have a commonality. We see each other every single day and we talk about the dog. We talk about how things are going. Why am I developing a relationship with him, with Keith? It's because I want to serve him, I want to love him, and I want to point him to Jesus. Who is that in your life? Who is that in your community that you are developing a relationship with them based on the common commonalities that you have with them so that you can serve them, love them, and point them to Jesus? We've seen that Jesus has built a relationship structure in his life based on four realms of relationship. The first is his core group. The second is his inner circle. The third realm is his community. But fourthly, it's the crowd. The crowd. You need to identify your crowd today. Jesus was an expert at creating and attracting a large crowd. In Luke 6, we see a large crowd there that day. The Jesus' core group was there. Jesus' uh, circle was there. His community was there. But also, there were other people that were outside of those realms that were in the very last realm where they were in the crowd. And this, the crowd really can be characterized as constant consumers. Constant consumers. They were constantly around Jesus. They were always around him, always and constantly consuming from him. They were always around him, but always wanting more from him, wanting him to teach them, wanting him to heal them, wanting him to perform a miracle, wanting him to do something for them. And Jesus didn't turn them away. No, not at all. He served them. He intentionally and continually poured himself out for them. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus says this of himself, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. If you are a follower of Jesus today, then your life should look like his. And that life should look like continually serving and pouring yourself out to those in the crowd 
to those that are around you that you are connected with. The Apostle Paul puts it in a, a, a little finer point on it in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, when he says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. There are people in your life that maybe you aren't completely transparent with them. You could be honest with them and serve them and love them and help them, but it doesn't mean that you always have to be around them or constantly at their beck and call. Instead, these are people that you come in contact with, but yet you should be prepared in order to serve them, in order to love them, in order to point them to Jesus. Why? Because this is how Jesus lived his life while he was here on this earth. Now, how did Jesus really interact with the crowd? Well, there's four ways that Jesus interacted with this constant consumer that is in the crowd. He was authentic, but he wasn't transparent. He was honest, he was open with them, but he wasn't sharing all of his greatest victories or his uh, 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 darkest trials. You don't see anyone in the crowd in the garden of Gethsemane that night. Instead, it was just the, his core, those three guys. Secondly, Jesus had a measured availability towards others. In Matthew 8, 18, it shows us that Jesus saw the crowd and he tells them, let's go to the other side of the, uh, of the lake. Let's get out of here. I don't want to be around them right now. Right now, I need to be alone. I just need to be with my, my inner circle and my core group. I just need to kind of be away from them. And so Jesus had a measured approach to his availability. Thirdly, he made reactive investments. Over and over again, Jesus healed people, uh, uh, ministered to them, served them after he asked them what he, they wanted him to do for them. So Jesus didn't just show up and say, oh, I know what you need. Here you go. Instead, he asked them, what do you want from me? And then he fulfilled their request. He had a reactive investment towards them. Fourthly, he showed inv invitational love. When Jesus was collecting all of his followers, when he's gathering his core, when he's gathering his circle, when he's gathering his community, what's he do? He says, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Jesus gives them a choice. Why? Because they have free will. They could follow him or not. And so Jesus invites people to come into relationship with him and so that he can love them and serve them. So Jesus' crowd were constant consumers, but he still loved them and served them to the best of his ability whenever he had the chance or when he had an int made intentional efforts to do so. So who's in your crowd today? Who is it that's on the outskirts? I'll give you a hint. It's anyone on Facebook. It's anyone on your social media page that you kind of don't really remember, but you're still friends with. Those people are in the crowd. It's the strangers on the subway or in traffic. It's the people that are shopping alongside of you at Target or Aldi. Uh, it, it's your neighbors that you may not know their name or you kind of do or you definitely know their dog's name. It, those are the people out in the crowd. And the way to best love them is to follow Jesus' Jesus's example by intentionally serving them, by reacting towards their needs, and by having a measured approach to your availability with them. Jesus establishes boundaries in his life so that he can create relational structures that help him love those around him. He, this relational structure, these four realms of relationship, helped Jesus love the people that were in his core. It helped him to love the people that were in his circle. It helped him to love the people that were in the, the community, but also those that were out in the crowd. Jesus structured his life and his relationships this way so that he could love those around him. This is what Jesus tells us in John chapter 13, 34 and 35. That we read this last week. We're going to read this again. We're going to read it next week. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples if you love one another. 
Jesus says love one another three times in just two verses. This is extremely important for him. He wants you to love one another no matter what realm of relationship you place this person in. No matter where they are, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter who they voted for, no matter what they think, Jesus says for you to love one another. So how can you best love the people that are in your core? How can you best love the people that are in your circle? How can you best love the people that are in your community? How can you best love the people that are in the crowd today? How is Jesus inviting you to love one another right now? Think about that, pray about that, and go do it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your example, for your model, and for the structure that you have placed in your life that we can now adopt and place in our life so that we can love people to the best of our ability, no matter where they are. Maybe they're off in the crowd and we don't really even know their names, but we kind of know their needs and we, we, we know how to meet those. Or the people that are right in our circle that no matter what's going on in our life, we they know exactly what's happening. They, they see the real us and what, what we really are struggling with and what we really are questioning. Jesus, we thank you for the relationships that are in our lives. Help us to love people the way that you want us to love them. Help us to build the relationships that we actually want today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.